welcome back to The Courage to Speak with me, Leonie Mellinger, the podcast that asks, what does it take to have the courage to speak up and speak out in life? Juliet Stevenson is a highly regarded British actor who has made a name for herself in theatre, film and television. She trained at the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art and made her stage debut in 1978. She has since appeared in numerous productions with the Royal Shakespeare Company, the National Theatre, the Almeida, in the West End and at the Royal Court Theatre, where she received an Olivier Award for her performance in Death and the Maiden. Juliet achieved critical acclaim for her performances in films such as Truly Madly Deeply, Bend It Like Beckham and Being Julia, for which she received a BAFTA nomination. She was awarded a CBE in 1999 for her services to drama. Throughout her career, she's been known for her versatility, range and intelligence as an actor. Most recently, she starred in Robert Icke's play The Doctor, a reworking of Arthur Schnitzler's 1912 Viennese play Professor Bernardi, winning the Critics Circle Theatre Award for Best Actress. Juliet is also a patron of several charitable organisations, including the refugee charity Young Roots, and is an ambassador for Amnesty. Welcome, Juliet. It's wonderful to have you as my guest. Thank Thank you. Thank you. Happy to be here. I wanted to start at the beginning and find out what you were like as a young child, whether you were back then shy or outgoing. It's quite a difficult question to answer, isn't it? Because you don't have any sort of external judgments of yourself, as it were. You only know how you felt. I think I was... Um, a mixture of both of those things. I think I became shy um, because of a series of very unhappy schools. I was an army kid, so my my dad was um, was posted around the world every two years or two and a half years in each posting. And we went to Australia, Germany, Malta, back to Germany again. Uh, It was very itinerant, and army schools were pretty bad, pretty rough. and I think the schools got worse between the age of sort of seven, eight, nine. They were really bad. And so I think I was driven into then unhappiness and shyness um, because they were really tough, quite cruel um, places. Um, but I think as a young child, I was quite outgoing and quite boisterous. Um, <laughs> I, one of my memories of being a child, I suppose, is that I, as I grew a little older, I didn't really feel like I wanted to do what I was expected to do in terms of being a girl. So the whole thing of how you should behave as a girl at that time, you know, troubled me. I mean, it just didn't feel right. I didn't want to play with dolls or be domesticated. I wanted to run around in the fields and be outside. And my best friend was a boy. And so I suppose I was a bit of a um, tomboy, which is a sort of rather stupid word, isn't it? But anyway. Do you um, have brothers? Is that? I have two older brothers, yeah. Not, not no sisters, just... So, no, so the youngest of three and, yeah. Uh-huh. Was that partly then one of the reasons why... You might have felt you didn't want to be a girl, you wanted to be I'm more. not sure. That's a good question. I mean, they went to school. You know, we were all sent to boarding schools very young. They went at eight and I went at nine. Nine? So, yeah. That's young. Yes. So mm. that... Mm. So, so I think I did... I did have The other very strong impression I had there, though, was when we lived in Malta, which was pre-tourism. So Malta was a very poor island in the middle of the Mediterranean. There was this army base there. We had a dog, a rescue dog, who one day jumped out the car window and went missing. And so mom, my mum and I had to go and look for it, which meant kind of going off the beaten track and going into some little towns and villages, driving around looking for our dog. And that took me to real, really poor areas of Malta, really dirt poor. And that was very vivid. I mean, that drive, I remember as though it was last week. Um, and that was my first encounter with real poverty. And the, the, the shock of it, like, hit me like... I felt branded, you know. I had never come across that before. And I remember it so vividly that I think it must have been very formative. Mm. And Mm. and then, of course, uh, paired with with the fact that in the army, the army is sort of nothing if not hierarchical. Mm. My dad was an officer, Mm. and my best friend Christopher's dad was... um, was not his he was not a ranked officer mm. so Christopher lived up in the sort of barracks you know place and we lived in a separate detached house and I remember increasingly thinking that was very unfair mm. so a sense of what wasn't fair and wasn't right sort of kicked in quite early on I think 
And were you encouraged by your father to speak out around the family dinner table? <laughs> well, I don't know about that. Um, I mean, I subsequently, when I became a teenager, I had a lot of arguments with my dad about the army and, you know, you know when I was going down to Greenwell Common and, and protesting against having American nuclear weapons on British soil mm. and so on, then we had a lot of arguments. And mm. he did shift to his eternal credit, you know, mm. he shifted his point of view. Um, no, I think my oldest brother had all the arguments because the oldest had to cut the path. Mm. And I think it was probably easier for me. I was quite rebellious, but I think they didn't mind so much because I was female. It was sort of inverted advantage of being, you know, of sexism that I, they didn't really sort of make me toe the line quite so much because it perhaps didn't matter quite so much because boys had to be in a certain, you know, yeah. I think that the, the, the gender prejudice thing maybe actually served me quite well. It certainly did when it came to what I wanted to do, you know, I mm. think to be an actor would have been a struggle if if I'd been a boy because they would have had a much more mainstream career or profession in mind. And at what um, point did you decide you wanted to act? Well something happened when I was, I mean I think I was pretty shy to answer your original yeah, question. I was yeah. very shy in my teens, I mean horrendously shy almost all, almost all the way through to my 20s in certain areas of my life. Right. Perhaps not when it came to politics but certainly yeah. when it came to myself as a young woman any sense of myself, certainly when it came to boys or sexuality or, you know, I, I was very lacking in confidence, um, felt like a weirdo, you know, I, I, I don't know why. I mm. grew up with very low self-esteem on, on, on all those areas. Um, but in relation to acting, and this is maybe connected to yes. that, this school I went to when I was nine and um, was quite good on the arts and uh, I think quite early on there was some sort of speech day happening and we were um, encouraged to read out something for the parents to entertain them and there was a whole lot of pieces of writing on the table and they said well pick up something and see if it appeals to you. So I picked up a piece of paper and on it was a poem which I now know was by W.H. Auden and mm -hmm. I now know was a love poem from one man to another. It doesn't state that but it's um, and it's called If I Could Tell You I Would Let You Know. And I read this poem, and it was one of those moments when a sort of light bulb completely got switched on. And it wasn't that I really understood it all, but the rhythms of the poem were compulsive, and I thought, I have to be the person who stands up and reads this poem. And mm. I said, can I read this? And I think they said, oh, no, that's not very appropriate. You know, here's a bit of Winnie the Pooh or something. And I said, no, I really, really want to read this poem. And I, I don't remember reading the poem. I just remember that moment of compulsion about wanting to be the vessel through which that poem passed. How fascinating. Yeah, and I had a very yeah. strong sense of that. It wasn't that it was my poem and I, it was I wanted to give utterance to this writer's mm. words mm. and communicate them to a bunch of people in mm. the audience. That was such a strong sense of what I wanted to do. Mm. And I go back to that memory because I often say to you know students, don't forget that is what we are. You know, don't yeah. entirely lose the plot about who we are. We are kind of we are vessels, we, you know, we are a sort of mediator between the writer and the audience. And of course that's personal and of course you bring all sorts of things to bear, but also don't get in the way too much of that, you know. I think it's quite a, a, sort of, uh, a good sort of reality check to remind ourselves of, of what we are. Absolutely. I, I, I found as an actor that it was much easier to communicate as somebody else and I could hide behind the character yeah. and I was absolutely not able to speak up as myself and I remember when you and I were in the Royal Shakespeare Company way back and we formed if you remember a women's group yeah. with uh, Sheila Hancock, Jane yeah. Jones and various people because it was felt that women didn't have enough of a voice back then and I remember being in awe of you because you were so able to speak up and I thought, how did she have the confidence to oh, do that? So yes. how did you manage to do that back then? Well, um, I think I always found speaking up as myself very difficult, like you. And the, I'm sure we would share the reasons for becoming actresses or actors. Um, because I think now I too feel that, yeah, there was a, such a freedom to be found in being someone else and being myself was miles more problematic and very often problematic and to some extent still is. And, um, and there's great freedom in letting all that go and being someone else, as you know. At that time, though, uh, you know, I had feminism arrived in my life sort of in my 20s, early-ish 20s. 
and it was such a rescue for me. It was, I mean, all those feelings in my early childhood that I've just described about feeling like weird and why don't I want to wear dresses and play with dolls and learn how to bake and actually don't, not only do I not want to do those things, I really, they made really make me feel like upset. That's just not who I am, you know. And and then when I got into my teens feeling there's something wrong with me, why aren't, why aren't my other friends like this? And and then I arrived in London, age 17, 18. I was very, quite political by then, sort of party political, but not not feminism. And and then when I discovered feminism, I realised there's a whole language for this. There's a whole culture out here. You know, it, it you're not alone. It's not that you're mm. weird. It's just that you haven't had access to this sort of... this perception of the world. There is a whole huge culture. The women writing amazing books and f- making films. And, and so when I arrived in London, like, like a, you know, a refugee, as it were, you know, I was rescued by the women's movement and then made lots of friends who were, and men and women, all very interested in, in issues of... Um, this was the 80s. Mm. Mm. Oh, well, the, no, the 70s. Mm. Yeah. So when, I met, when, when you and I were in that company together um, and I found that the Royal Shakespeare Company had 12 white male directors, mm. no women directors, yeah. nobody, no, absolutely no diversity, mm. I began to get frustrated with that and started to challenge it. And then when they were very resistant to that change, mm. um, then the sort of, I suppose, kind of anger about that made me able to stand up and speak about it. So that's interesting. So it's the anger that motivates you or encourages you and gives you gives you the courage to be able to speak out. I mean, anger or indignation or just a sense of this is simply not right. Mm. This is just so crazily not right that I cannot be quiet about it. Mm. And that's what drove me to get over the shyness about speaking out. I mean, I did find it very difficult. On the occasions I've had to speak from a stage you know, I don't know, at the end of a show, during the curtain call to say, you know, we're remembering this person we've just heard has died today. Those moments when you have to stop performing and be yourself, I used to find, I mean, terrifying. I had to do it, but I found it really scary. But but propelled by a belief that something isn't right, then that gives me a kind of, um, yeah. A reason to do it. A reason yeah. Yeah. to get over the, yeah. the, the inhibiting... Yeah. Forces. Don't you think it's amazing that at drama school, at least when I was there, we were not taught at all how to perform ourselves? And so I had an experience where I had to stand up and talk as me, and I I was completely, back then, not able to do it. So I had to teach myself that skill much later in life. That's really interesting. Yeah. I think it didn't cross my mind that we weren't taught that skill, but we certainly weren't. Mm. No. But then I didn't even know how to be somebody else for the first couple of terms. You know, it took me a while because I didn't know who I was. Mm. I, didn't know, I was so confused at 18. So that whole journey into, I know I want to do this and I know I have a sort of modicum of talent, but I, I think I do, but I had no idea how to go about it. I mean, it was excruciating the first few months. Are um, there key moments where you felt you, you went through something where you learned something that gave you more confidence to subsequently be more able to speak out because now now you're speaking on so many different subjects you're speaking out you know on behalf of refugees um, all sorts Mm. of different subjects i mean i think like anything you the more you do it the easier it gets you know the more you go to the dentist the less scary it is you know the, the the more you do your scales and arpeggios on the piano you know the the better you get i mean it's you know practices everything but I think, you know, there are also really glorious things that come with getting older. There's a lot of crap that comes with getting older, as we know. And um, But there are huge compensations. And for me, the compensations, I really don't give a toss um, about what people think um, in the way that I did. Of course, I care what people think. And, you know, I'm reaching out to, to, to communicate to, to, to people about what they might think and not think. But... I'm much more courageous. I finally, you know, I'm in my 60s and I'm finally got a kind of freedom and I just don't care so much. I don't care if people don't like what I say, if they make, if it makes, I'm really interested in having the debate with them, but I'm not as frightened. And I always was, I think, you know, women particularly were so brought up to please. Well, I was anyway, you know, my, mm. maybe it's my generation, but I think this is a whole other mm. subject, mm. a huge subject, mm. but we're so, maybe maybe men too, you know, I don't think it's just gender, but I think 
traditionally the genders have been brought up with expectations imposed on them in different ways and I think you know, I know that I had a reputation as a young actor for being difficult, in inverted commas. Now, I know that if I'd been a young actor, a male actor in the room, I would not have had that epithet True. attached yeah, to me, yeah. without question. Yeah. Because I saw it happen. Mm. And people who questioned directors and were lively in the room and wanted to know why a decision was being made creatively, or they were considered to be interesting, exciting young actors. And women, you know, and I saw so many really smart women in that company, you know, Leonie, mm. Mm. at the RSC, dumb themselves down. Mm. And you'll have seen it. Mm. Absolutely. Actors, act, female actors dumbing themselves down in order to be more acceptable, to get employed again. And I know that I did, um, you know, get myself into trouble for speaking out. And it was sometimes scary. I mean, I got into hellish trouble at the RSC. They, I mean, Terry Hans wrote me a, a, a note saying, you cannot be a gorilla in an establishment tank. You know, shut what? up or get out, basically. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, and that was just about, you know, why are all the men here white? You know, why, why, why are all the directors here Oh. white men um, fascinating I mean to be fair you know, he lost his temper in the end and he gave us that slot in the schedule but that wasn't what we were asking for we weren't asking for one slot in the schedule we were asking for a whole mindset to change is let's have these Shakespeare plays interpreted by people from other backgrounds mm. other views of the world mm. it would be so interesting and exciting creatively to do that it wasn't like a war it was an invitation mm. but he it was perceived as a war so I did get into some trouble and have you ever been fearful of speaking out because you were worried about the response? Oh, yeah. Loads. I mean, as you know, there are issues. Increasingly, I'm really sad to say that it's becoming extremely difficult to talk about. Mm. And it's a source of increasing worry, concern, sadness, and sometimes anger. You know that, you, that, that there are becoming sort of silences surrounding certain subjects and there's a kind of bullying going on that means people are scared to to speak up I mean um, time and time again as an actor um, in a company in the West End people are not happy with conditions they're being overworked the conditions are terrible or something mm. actors are great moaners as we know you know we love to have a moan but when then management walks in and you say okay let's we have an opportunity here to express our concerns you know this is not right and that's not right people will not speak up mm. and they will not speak up and think, guys, if you're going to moan, please channel that into making your your concerns known to the people in a position to change them. And people are scared. And I think that, you know, the whole idea of a union, which was born out of the idea that nobody, no individual worker in any industry should be um, personally jeopardized by fighting for better conditions or pay or whatever. The union took responsibility collectively and um, that's just so disappeared. So, you know, our work now is not unionised. You don't have to be a member of the union. And whatever we think of that, um, what it means is that it is very much down to you. If you make any sort of trouble, in, in inverted commas, then you will not be asked. Of course, we do have a union that still does fight f for us, but that, that's, one, that's one area. Yeah. But in terms of what I was talking about, about fear of speaking out, you know, of course, there are issues now increasingly in this culture, as we know, which you, which you can't question. And what do you think is the effect of social media and cancel culture? Because that, that's really made it even harder in many ways. Well, I mean, massive. Massively. Um, I made the great mistake when I first went on Twitter of thinking that it was a debating chamber, which was very naive of me. I suppose everybody has to learn that it's not the hard way. And I learned the hard way. I do um, support a Palestinian charity um, that brings medical aid into, particularly for mothers and children, but you know, the, the hospitals and health care situation in, in the Gaza and the occupied territories is terrible, as you know. Mm. Now for that, I have been really, really given a very hard time. Um, yeah. I spoke about it once at a rally in, in Trafalgar Square and was followed all the way back long journey back to the tube by a very um, aggressive, frightening individual who just wanted to sort of punish me for speaking out about it. And oh um, mm. I mean, as you know, the Palestinian issue is, it's very difficult to talk about Israel and Palestine now without being accused of. Um, and I once tweeted something in, on Twitter which uh, created a huge furor and became really, really frightening. Um, and in the end, I, I left Twitter because I thought, oh, I, I don't really want to be on this, um, 
on this platform, this forum, if it's not a debating chamber. If it's an echo chamber, then I need to get out of it because it's not good for me to be in an echo chamber or good for anyone, you know. Not at all. I totally agree on how ghastly for you to go through that experience. But do you think that in some way may have had uh, the effect of stopping you talking out sometimes? I, well, that's a really interesting question. So w- when I'm asked to do something, and I am quite a lot, if I feel frightened to do it, which happens quite regularly, I just have a rule, really, and I think, OK, so what are you frightened of? What is it that you're frightened of? And then look at the fear, look at the people who might be frightening you. Who are they? Why are they doing it? Um, what do you think might happen to you if you do this thing or say this thing or sign this letter? Or What are the consequences? And if I think that I'm just scared for my career, my safety, which isn't very likely, it's probably career. And also, you know, I'm going to then invite a whole lot of horrendous ab- abuse, which I don't want to own, um, then I have to, I, have to, I have to look at those things and decide whether I'm still going to go ahead or not. I don't like being um, made to feel frightened when I think it's an important cause, so I might try and make myself get over that fear and do it anyway. I would say some of the time I do that and some of the time I don't. So you it's, have to make a judgment call. You make a judgment every call. Time. You have to make a judgment call. And I mean, I am, you know, I've had to earn my living, you know, um, I'm probably the main breadwinner, you know, I've had to pay the kids' bills and the household bills. So I can't afford, I don't, you know, I wouldn't be able to do much else for a living. I can't afford not to work. And so I have to be careful not to completely alienate myself. But I hope that wouldn't happen if I was speaking on something which I felt was important. But I think the times we're living in now are really, really frightening because. The power of social media is impacting on everyone. I mean, everybody is responding. Basically, you know, theatres are making programming their events and their whole year schedules according to what they are, you know, frightened of a lot of the time. It's it's also about what they're what they believe in. I hope, but it, you know, I think many many people are operating from fear, and I mean, fear is also a good thing. Let's not forget. Mm. Sometimes fear is saying, you know, telling you you're afraid of this thing because you haven't been doing it. And there's a, there's a, there are voices saying, you should be doing more of this. Why aren't you doing more of this? So that, you know, so you're fearful of, in, you know, of, of, of inviting opposition or criticism from that camp. Then you, then you make a change and you, you meet that demand quite right that you do. So it's not, it's not always a bad thing. Fear is there for a reason. But I think the social media bullying has is, 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 is been devastating for us all because... Mm. It's not about conversation. It's not about freedom of thought. It's the opposite. And I think that freedom of thought is massively under attack in this country. Mm. Freedom of speech, certainly, without question. You know, I mean, we've got a government who are now bringing in bills to stop people demonstrating about against injustices. Yes. You know, they're going to literally stop people protesting, and um, that's already in the in the in the statute books. And and um, so I think. That's a slightly different issue again, but it's been born out of a certain intolerance in the culture, I think, that makes that kind of legislation possible. Yeah, that is really scary, because in some countries you you can be arrested for tweeting the wrong thing. Yeah, indeed. Um, So for that to start here, that one is not allowed to speak out, is very scary, I think. Absolutely, it's Mm. really scary and it's happening. And Mm. there's a lot of legislation that I don't think everybody's even aware of that's gone through Mm. already, shutting down protest or dissent. Mm. Um, And we have such a long, proud history of dissent in this country, you know, and almost all good progressive change has happened as a result, not of governments, but of movements by ordinary people, you know. Mm. Whether you know the Chartists, the suffragette—I mean, you know—you well, you can go poll tax right. I mean, you can you can you can go back in history, and almost every significant change happened as a result of popular dissent, um, propelled very often by working people who just thought we've had enough of this. This is not right, and they then become lionised by history. You know, I mean, you go into the House of Commons. I went into Westminster. Hall and there on the wall is this big plaque saying, you know, to honour the suffragettes and we honour the great heroines who brought this country women's suffrage. And I thought, what? <laughs> you are literally the guys who locked them up and beat them yes. and force fed them and, you know, you are literally the same guys 
um, you know, yeah, let's lionize them now. But who now you're doing exactly the same thing to climate change protesters. You know, in 100 years, will you be having plaques on the wall if, if we still exist? Yes. You know, saying we honor the great climate change protesters who uh, I don't, you know. So it's it's a sort of irony of Britain that they they really um, they really make it hard to be a dissenter uh, about significantly wanting to change the status quo. And do you feel in any way that having a profile means that you have some sense of responsibility to speak up on behalf of, of those whose voices may not otherwise be heard, such as refugees? I do. I mean, um, it's a question you know I often get thrown at quite you know, aggressively sometimes, why, why should you be speaking about this? And it's, I can see why people ask that question. I really can. Um, and I think it's important not to speak up about things you don't know anything about, really. And I don't. Now I've li- largely narrowed it down to refugees because I have spent a lot of time and many, many, many years working alongside refugee charities. And, you know, I was in Calais in the jungle quite a lot. We had two projects running there. And I think in that say, in, in, in that instance, I'd say, look, these, these are voices that can't be heard. I, I, I'd much rather these people were able to speak for themselves. They should be speaking for themselves. We should be listening. But you're not. So yes, it is going to take people like us to give voice to their narratives until such a time that you will listen to their narratives yourselves. You know, let's fight for that time. You know, I don't want it. To, it's not for me to be talking about the experiences of Syrian women or young men from Afghanistan. But if nobody else is, is, is listening, then of course people in my position, and there are quite a lot of them, will be will be giving voice. And in a way that's what we do, isn't it? In a way that's a job description, you know, giving voice to characters, hmm. those silent characters we, we put together and play. Um, I certainly think in, in my industry too, people like us do have to speak up for younger actors, people who don't have the status or the power or the confidence um, I definitely feel that in a company, for example, it's definitely up to me mm. and some of the other leading actors to speak for younger actors or who are, might be scared or not be quite clear about mm. what they're entitled to. But but in the world, yeah, I think uh, as long as you really know what you're talking about, I would not get up and talk about you know leukemia or you know or I, I wouldn't I wouldn't or any you know random random uh, randomly picked but. Because you do have to be able to defend yourself, Mm. because you will be attacked. And do you think? Do you think? Do you feel that you've made headway in any way with the whole arguments against people who say we shouldn't allow these refugees in because they're 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 criminal, and they should absolutely be sent off to Rwanda? That's really. It's a great question. I'm not sure. I could give an answer because I really don't know. You very often don't know what the impact of a campaign is or... I mean, I recently, just literally two or three weeks ago, we did a protest against the Rwanda policy and I found out all the information and data about it, how much it's cost so far. You know, not one person has yet been sent, thankfully. Um, And it's already cost huge amounts of money Mm. to the public Mm. taxpayer and huge amounts of money have been given to the Rwanda government to run the scheme and... um, It's a kind of tragedy because it's not only beyond brutal and cruel and an infringement of international law in terms of seeking asylum is a legal right. Mm. But also it's, you know, it's incredibly expensive and stupid. I mean, (laughs) you know, the whole argument that we have a huge crisis in the in the employment market here, you know, we are desperately short staffed in many industries, you know, long haul driving, transport. Uh, hospitality, hotels, the care industry for our increasingly elderly population, nurses, doctors. There are so many industries that, you know, fruit pickers. There are so many industries that are struggling with being under understaffed, and then so many people come to this country would happily be working in some of those industries, and would, you know, they'd be paying taxes, they'd be paying national insurance. You know, it's just so crazy to be spending huge amounts of money um, on such brutal policies. Uh, On every level, it's just a bad idea. I think once you get a chance to talk about the practicalities and the economics, it sometimes does have an impact. Um, I mean, the struggle is to reach people who don't think the way you do. It's very often, you know, the great worry is, are we just already talking to the converted? Um, Hmm. 
but three weeks ago, for example, Channel 5 has had us in the news studio that day and, and I went with a young refugee who spoke for, very eloquently for himself as well and they were extremely receptive. So, I mean, I hope so. Mm. I hope so. I have a great belief in... I mean, I really think this country is quintessentially full of really decent, good, kind people. I think that the brutality is, in, is a minority. I may be naive, but I, I, I believe that. Mm. Mm. And... Um, we have a history of showing people enormous kindness historically. You know, when you look at taking in 10,000 children on kinder transport in the Second World War, mm. or, or we took in 5,000 children from the Spanish Civil War, and that was, an, again, a people-driven initiative. People went out of their way during COVID in very recent times to look after neighbours, check up on the elderly, food shop for them, you know, those mm. who couldn't get out, those who were isolated. You know, the blitz spirit in this country, as you know, is, is alive and kicking. And I think people want to feel that they're in real communities and able to be in contact with real human beings and not just online and, and be able to be decent. And um, But they are fed huge amounts of disinformation by the tabloid press and by the media who have vested interests in um, propping up this government's hostility to immigration, which we know is, is you know, is peddled for all sorts of reasons, um, not least to divert people's anger about, you know, what they're having to endure at the hands of this government. And do you think you ever choose roles because through the the, the role you can put forward arguments? I mean, the, the Doctor, for example, was a f- fascinating production because um, s- some people were on the side of the doctor and some people were very much not so it really got people talking on mm. both sides and I mm. think that was the beauty of the production mm. as well and so uh, is that one of the reasons you you so loved I w- would imagine you loved because you did it for, yes. for a while didn't you yeah no I do yeah. I did yeah. love it. I do love it and we're taking it to New York soon so it'd be fascinating to see no yeah I mean I, I as an actor I'm sure you're the same I it, what what mainly matters to me is what's this piece we're all making more than the role actually is this a piece that speaks to the times we live in number one question does it speak to the times we're living in interestingly I don't like polemical stuff I don't like stuff that only takes one point of view I really love going into all the complexity of the arguments and I think that theatre has increasingly a role to play in that because that cancel culture that social media culture that we're talking about is very binary very often or black and white and, and, and theatre offers up, and film offers up the grey, doesn't it? The, the, the detail, the places between the extreme positions on any one view and, and the contradictions and all that interesting human stuff. Mm. And that's what The Doctor, which is so brilliantly written, does. Mm. And I think that I don't certainly agree with my character. You know, she, she behaves in a way which is quite alien to me. But I really, really love that. I love playing somebody who's not particularly likeable. Hmm. and I don't encourage them to like me. You know, in that TV debate where that she's being bombarded and yes. interrogated, you know, I they tend to... I can feel there's a tendency to side with me because I am being um, in- interrogated, but I work quite hard to be as sort of yeah. opinionated and arrogant yeah. and, you know, and, and single-minded as possible because I hope that that will make them listen to each of those panel members as well and see that it's not a us and them situation it's not a you know I'm not I'm not the heroine she's mm. the protagonist but she's not the heroine she's not you know you could question all sorts of judgments the important thing is the questions you know mm. Mm. and I think that's what people loved about the show and it, and it made me realize there's a sort of hunger to get back to places which are complicated multi-layered contradictory you know because that's where we live you mm. know very few of us have absolutely concrete opinions about you know, it, it, we live in the, hmm, I don't know, I mean, sometimes I think that, sometimes I think this, you know, um, and that's, you know, a, a more human place to be, but it's where we're being driven out of by, by these forces of absolutism on social media. So I think there was a sort of hunger coming off the audience in The Doctor for, for those debates, nobody's right, nobody's wrong, let's just throw it all up in the air and see where it lands, you know. Mm, fantastic. Um, what advice would you give somebody who is fearful of speaking out and speaking up? I mean, is there is there a way one can learn to become more confident in doing that? I mean, that's another great question. It's really complicated to answer it. Um, I mean, I always say, you know, to students and to my own kids, you know, be as true to yourself as you can, but that you know that begs a whole lot of questions about which self are you being true to? You know, we're not just one self. 
um, you have to have a sense of that self before you can be true to it. Follow your hunch, follow, follow your instinct, you know, if something feels really wrong to you, try to have the courage not to do it, you know, particularly to young women, if something's not feeling right, have the courage to say this is not feeling right. This is not, I'm not comfortable, um, there's something going on here, I don't, you know, try to do that. And now, thank God, there is more of a framework with which young women um, can say that because we've had... Me Too. Me Too yes. movement. I yeah. mean, that, you know, I, God, if I could have done with that when I was younger and yeah, I saw you too. I mean, I, I, mm. I'm sure I didn't get much attention in that area because I... But, I mean, I remember always, always feeling that everything was up to me to cope with or not cope with and and that it must be my fault and all those things and now I'm really glad that you know there is a structure there is a vocabulary there's language out there I would I would encourage um yeah I mean I think it's crucially important for people to stand up and and say what they believe but I realize that I'm in a really privileged position you know I have status it probably won't cost me my my living if I you know, people, some people won't employ me, I'm sure, but, you know, so far there are plenty of people who have. And so it's easier for me to do that. So I think it would depend who it was, you know. I get really frustrated with people in my industry who are sort of experienced like me, older like me, um, have status like me, who don't stand up and speak out about things. And there's a very small number of people who do. True. And I do get frustrated about it because I think, guys, you know, the, look at the world. Yeah. And what, what's going to happen before you feel there's something more important than yeah. <laughs> protecting your career at every level? And anyway, actually, you know, in America, there are some wonderful actors speaking out about things. I mean, look at Matt Damon and the water issue. And it's not mm. a very sexy issue. Matt Damon has committed himself to this issue of clean drinking water in the developing world. And, um, you know, and I think everybody really admires him for it. I don't think it's doing his career anyhow. It's a fairly safe subject. You couldn't really argue against it, um, to be to be fair. But um but there are, you know, I, 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 I do wish more people would stand up and speak out. Um so I think the answer to your question is it would depend on who they were and what was at stake for them. But I would always on principle encourage people to speak to their own truths and to speak truth to power. Juliet, thank you so much. And I hope that people, and I'm sure people listening to you, will feel motivated. And I hope they do to have the courage to speak. Thank oh. you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for having me, Leonie. It's been lovely. Thanks for listening to The Courage to Speak, presented by me, Leonie Mellinger. The Courage to Speak is produced by Anushka Warden, with sound production by Theo Bosenket and music by Guy Pearson. For more information on The Courage to Speak, visit www.melinger.co.uk.